try that again. Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, a fellow follower of Jesus, or maybe you're just someone who's looking to learn more about Jesus and what Christianity is all about. As a church, our aim is simple. We want to connect you to Jesus, the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And in doing that, we want to connect you to others because community is God's idea and, and it'll help you walk toward, toward Jesus with others. We want to also help you grow. Grow as a whole person, grow in your faith. If you're going to be a Christian, you want to have a dynamic relationship with God and join others in that journey of faith. And finally, we simply want to help you find ways to invest your life, to be part of something bigger than yourself. And when you join yourself to Jesus, you're part of the biggest mission that's ever been done on the earth. And you can impact your home, your family, the people you love, the people you work with, you can impact your town and your city. Today, we hope you'll be encouraged by the sermon but here's some information on some upcoming events first. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our live groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. It's a, a real privilege to, to speak here even though I'm part of this church and have some deep history, if I can say that with it, it's always good to be able to share. And I've been on a, uh, I would say, a deep dive into the book or the epistle to the Ephesians for the last few months. And yeah, I, I'm the kind of person that have to do something with it. I was reminded while we were worshiping this morning that this month was 50, 50 years ago, this month is when I met the Lord. So, uh, yeah, and, he, and he, hasn't, he hasn't got rid of me, which is a really good, really good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I want to start with a story and uh, kind of set, set the mood for something. I'd like to tell this in the first person. But it really, it really deals with a young Bible school student who's asked to go and teach a Sunday school class at a church that is just kind of looking for someone to come in and, and, and help their young people. And this was a junior high school class that this Bible school student was going to. And he was new. This is the first time he'd ever gone and done anything outside of sharing in, in chapel or that sort of thing. So he gets started in this, in this class, and he thinks, well, I'll start with a question and see if I can get a conversation going. So he asks, he says, who broke down the walls of Jericho? Dead silence. Nobody answers. Finally, one of the kids puts his hand up. He says, uh, I'd like to say something. He says, well, what's your name? He says, my name is Bobby. He said, okay, Bobby, who broke down the walls of Jericho? He said, to be completely honest, I don't know, but it wasn't me. <laughs> and so the, the Bible school student thinks, oh my gosh, we're really in trouble here. So he goes to the Sunday school teacher afterwards, and he tells them the story. And the Sunday school teacher turns around and he says, well, one thing I know, I know Bobby, and if he says he didn't do it, he didn't do it. (laughs) 
Should I go to the Sunday school superintendent <laughs> who writes a letter to the young man and says, we're really sorry about the walls of Jericho falling down. If you write out an estimate, we'll see what we could do to raise the money to pay for it. <laughs> I tell that story, I wish it was me, I tell that story that just kind of exaggerates the problem in the church. That for the most part, the church, especially the Western church, is biblically illiterate. We, we wouldn't pass some of the just information parts of the Old and New Testament. We, we'd be stuck. To, when I say we, I'm incorporating myself into this. We'd be stuck into understanding the scripture, uh, just even the information part of it. And the, the problem is, first of all, the Bible is a hard book. It's a, let's, I shouldn't even call it a book. It's kind of like a library. And it's difficult, especially the Old Testament. The Old Testament, for most of us, is like that uncle that shows up to family gatherings that nobody really wants to go and talk to. You, know, you kind of like shy away from him because you're afraid of what he'll say or do. And we read the Old Testament, but we don't know what we're reading and we don't know how we're, re how we're supposed to read it. And what we don't understand is that the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. The, the New Testament is not ignoring the Old Testament. It's actually digging into the Old Testament and mining out all of the truths that we need to know. Now, could you get along with just the New Testament? I think you can do so for a while. But if questions bother you the way they bother me, you have to go back and dig. And you have to understand. Now, I mentioned I, I, I met the Lord 50 years ago. I was raised a Roman Catholic. We read our Bible on Easter. That was about the only time that it ever came out, and it was, it was so big it usually took two people to carry it. And... You had no idea what you were reading, but you had to find that part of the, the, the Gospels where Jesus died and rose again. And that's all you were supposed to read because everything was left up to the priest. Anybody else have that experience? I had no idea. I had no idea what the Bible was about when I got saved other than I knew I, I, I really thought there was something special about Jesus. I thought I always felt that way. I never felt like he was just a mythical figure or anything like that. And so 50 years later, here we are, and I'm going to share three sermons, three messages on the, the epistle to the Ephesians. Now, this was the second, uh, second book in the Bible that I actually studied in depth in the basement of the church that a Bible school would emerge out of. The pastor gave me, gave me two assignments, one to do an in-depth study on the, the epistle to the Romans and the other one to Ephesians. And I did okay on Romans, but Ephesians really took me into another place. And I, I ruminated on this book for, for years before I started pastoring here in Coltsneck at Community Gospel Church. How many of you, uh, looking around, just not very many of you were there when I preached through Ephesians? Yeah, okay, okay there was a few of you there. 50-something sermons on Ephesians. Went verse by verse, sometimes word by word. And now I'm going to try to do it in three. Ain't going to happen. So this is a good point that Les Taylor and I are going to do a Bible study on Ephesians beginning sometime in the middle of September. And we're going to go until Thanksgiving and uh, do a little bit more of an in-depth, get into some of the rabbit holes for Ephesians. But what I want to do in these next three Sundays is really look at this idea of uncovering God's mystery. Because the Ephesian epistle 
is an apocalyptic piece of literature. And when we say apocalyptic, what do we mean by that? And so this is just part one. We're just going to deal with, with one issue of it in, um, if I can get my slides to work, there we go. If we could get this, this is just part one. And let me give you a little bit of background and so that we understand this. There are, how many of you believe there are two realms, at least two, but two that we know of, yeah? There's the earthly realm, and then there's the heavenly realm. Okay, and you notice what I've done in, the, in this diagram, this Venn diagram actually, is, is shown you that, that they overlap. How many of you believe that there is an unseen realm present with us right now? Yeah? Anybody unconvinced about that? Yeah. I mean, even, even if you went at it philosophically, you could make, make sense of it. Like, where are numbers? Somewhere. But the, these two realms overlap. Can you think of places in the Bible where the unseen became seen? Actually, the Bible starts with the unseen being seen. Yeah? Because God walked with Adam in the garden. So he made his self known, and we know that God is what? Invisible. He's spirit. He's invisible, yet he walked with Adam in the garden. I'm so tempted to chase a rabbit right now, but not going to. But where, any other place where you see it? Jacob's ladder? Burning bush? Yeah? There's more than one place where God says he uncovers something, which is what we'll get into in a minute. He uncovers the scene or the unseen by just revealing it. That's what that word apocalypse means, and we'll look at that in a minute here. So what I plan to do is show you that Ephesians is a piece of apocalyptic literature. It is an uncovering. But first, what does this word apocalyptic mean? Well, it <clears throat> there are several ways to skin this cat. One of them is a literal way. It means to uncover, to reveal, to pull a blanket off of something. That's, that is the truest uh, literal meaning of the word apocalypse. It's like when you want your kid to get out of bed to go to school and you go in the bedroom and you take the covers off of them and say, get up. That's what, that's what that word literally means. It's that kind of uncovering. And we, we often, mean, today, if you say the word apocalypse, everybody goes, oh. like we're going to see something. You know, the, and think of the end times. The book of Revelation is the book of uncovering. It's not the futuristic idea. It's what's going on now. Now, that is my interpretation of Revelation. You can have another one. It's free, no charge. You can believe whatever you'd like to. I believe it's an uncovering of what's going on in the world now, going on in the universe now, for God's purposes. Okay, so there's a metaphorical meaning of this word also, and that's to reveal an idea or a new fact. So it's that understanding that that's what we're dealing with. God is uncovering an idea or a new fact, something that we don't know or something that we don't see. And then there, there are these things that are associate meanings, bring to light, illuminate, enlighten, enlighten, turn on the light, or turn the light on. So what we want to do, first of all, is to understand this uncovering. We want to understand what's going on in Ephesians. I was so tempted, and um, I'll give you a little bit of an uncovering. Uh, I was wrestling with God over the last few days. I just wanted to read the epistle to the Ephesians. Just wanted to stand here and read it. 
and have you listen to it. Maybe you listen to it on, on um, a recording or what, what do we listen to it on now? Um, our phones or wherever we can do it. Just, just listen to it, just to hear it. But actually, I'm going to read quite a bit of it um, because what I'd want to do is look at the first three chapters this morning. Is that possible? Can we, can we look at just the first three chapters? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out how long it takes. There's no giant game on today, so we don't have to worry. And the Little League World Series is not starting until Thursday, so we, we've got a few times that we could do this. <clears throat> so <clears throat> basically, what Paul loves to do, and, and I think it's part of what happened to him, let me just back up a step. If you were God, and I know it's hard to imagine, even though sometimes we act like we are. That was a joke, by the way. Did you get that? And you wanted to bring this message of Jesus. Would you choose a scholar to do that if you wanted to bring this, this message to Jews? Would you bring someone who could refute every idea that they have contradicting the gospel from the Old Testament? Would you bring a scholar to that, or would you bring a fisherman? You'd bring a scholar, wouldn't you? And if you had Gentiles who knew nothing about the Old Testament at all, would you bring a Jewish scholar to teach them the deep things of the Old Testament? Or would you bring them a blue-collar guy who's out catching fish all the time? You'd bring the fishermen. What does God do? Just the opposite. He takes perhaps one of the most knowledgeable men of his day in the Old Testament who speaks Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin and sends him to the Gentiles to teach them the Old Testament. God sees different than we do. Yeah? He surprises us, doesn't he? And so Paul, especially in Ephesians, he loves to use this word mystery. And you'll see that he'll just keep on talking about this word mystery and he'll be uncovering it for us. He doesn't leave it as a mystery that you have to be super spiritual to understand it. He doesn't leave it where you have to be really intelligent to understand it. He puts it in the plainest language using artifacts or, or, or symbols that can help you understand what he's saying. And for me, Ephesians is a guidebook for local churches. I think it's a guidebook for the whole church, but I think especially for local churches on how we ought to live in this realm of the kingdom of God. It's not just another epistle. Do you know that the earliest copies of Ephesians does not have to the church at Ephesus in it? It's more like to the church at fill in the blank. It's not until about the fourth century that any, that any epistles show up, that any copies show up, rather, with the word Ephesus in it. So this was an epistle that circulated. And it circulated among Gentile churches. And at the time, there still were Gentile churches and Jewish churches. There were some that were mixed, but the majority of them were Gentile or Jewish churches. And Paul was combating something by writing this epistle. I, I'm trusting that if you don't know the depth of Ephesians and somehow I'm able to communicate it to you, it's going to change your life. It's going to change how you live. That's my aim. Yeah. My next slide doesn't want to advance. One of these days. Talk awkwardly among yourselves. Well, we, 
There we go. <clears throat> Ephesians is an epistle or a letter declaring and inviting all humans to comprehend and respond to an uncovering. And once that uncovering has been revealed to you, it changes the way you live. So there are two realms that we're, going, that we're looking at, two realms that we have to understand. And if you're like me, you forget about the unseen realm more than you should. We tend to live according to our flesh. And I don't mean being carnal or unspiritual, but we live according to, to, the, to the senses that we have to, to apprehend what's material around us and to situations around us. Do you think... This is a rabbit hole. Do you think that God is really interested in politics? Do you think he sits on the throne wondering about who's going to get elected? No, he knows everything. It's not even a concern to him. You know what he is concerned about? Listen, get this, people go into hell. That's what God's concerned about. And the church infights over the stupidest darn things that you can imagine. And we separate the church. We become the modern day version of Jews and Gentiles. We know better than you guys do. We're superior than you. You don't get what we get. That's what we do. Come on now. And don't put your hand up, but yeah. Guilty. Guilty as charged. I'm having the darnest style. I'll tell you, I had more things to go on this week than I could imagine. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to start in chapter 3, and then I'm going to back up to chapter 1. So am I backwards? Yes. L just listen to, to chapter 3. If you've brought your Bible with you, good. That's a really good thing is bring your Bible to church. Paul says this, for this reason. What do you make of that statement? He's going he's to tell us something that either he's done or something that is prompted in. He said, I, Paul prisoner of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. In other words, it's because of you I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He doesn't say I'm a prisoner of Caesar. He says I'm a prisoner of Jesus. And then he goes off and he does what Paul does more than a few times. He says, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace given to me, which was given to me for you, that by revelation or uncovering, there was made known to me, there it is, that word that is kind of in there, to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And he's talking about the earlier part of Ephesians. He says, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed or uncovered to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Now, did you get that? God kept this mystery from people until this time. This mystery, we'll see, was not just something God thought up like second idea. First one didn't work, let's do the second one. Let's do plan B. When plan A doesn't work, you go to plan B, right? Nah, that's not the way it worked. He says... Here it is, folks. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, which I was made a minister. So he's telling the Gentiles, who the Jews call dogs, that they are now fellow heirs. They're inheriting everything the Jews, God's chosen people, the special people, these dogs are now equal to them. Aren't you happy about that? Yes. 
We Gentiles inherit everything. Yeah. We're fellow members of the body. Let me tell you the story, okay, in case you're not up on this. The Jews had a temple where God lived. All the peoples of the earth worshipped false gods. The Jews, Hebrews, the Israelites, were the only ones who had a temple where God lived. And they had a wall that would keep you as a Gentile out of it. Matter of fact, if you crossed that wall, you'd be dead in seconds. They would stone you to death. You were not allowed in there. You were like someone with leprosy. You were like someone with a deformity in their body. You were not allowed into that place. And Paul turns around now and says, you are fellow heirs fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. This gets better. He says, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the, the unfathomable riches of Christ and bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So he's like tipping his hand right here. He's saying this, this was created by God who, or hidden in God who created everything. So God created it hidden. Yeah? And until the time of Jesus, people walked around in ignorance but now, the goods have been laid out. Everything is uncovered that we could see what it is now. And he says it this way, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. When? Now. now. Through who? The manifold, many-faceted wisdom of God. Many-sided, many-faceted, like a diamond has all these different facets were, were hidden in God, but now they're made known so that now, how many times have I said now? The church, right, can make this known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, when did this all come about? This was in accordance, this was tied to, this was embedded in the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access to. Man, this is exciting stuff. So now the church can demonstrate the purpose of God revealed in Jesus. That's basically what he's saying. And let me just say this. That Paul said the word, I've been given this stewardship. Now, his stewardship was to preach to the Gentiles. Yeah? Stewardship is responsibility. If you're giving, given stewardship for something, you are responsible for, some, for that thing. All right? Like we, we hear our kids are not our own, we're just responsible for them. Yeah? They're really gods. That's what we understand. But we're responsible. We're given stewardship for them. And now we are the Gentiles who are the beneficiaries of Paul's uncovering this mystery. Yeah? Unless you were born and you are still, you could trace your heritage back to Abraham through all the lineage that there is, and be a, be a Hebrew of Hebrews. You're a Gentile. Yeah. Maybe a proselyte. But basically, we are the recipients of Paul doing this. Now, here's the question. Do we have a stewardship? Yeah? Because we're the church. The church might now demonstrate the purpose of God that was, is revealed in Jesus. And, and here's what we'll get to the last week. To the rulers and authorities in the heavenlies. 
what in heaven are they? Huh? So you see what Paul is doing as he's going from the seen into the unseen. He's saying that this overlap, there's something in the cosmic universe that the church has the responsibility to, to declare and do warfare with. <laughs> going to have a fit here, a Holy Ghost fit. Okay, so he, here are the things that, that we understand. The Gentiles are part of the, the plan, right? Now, this is from, from, chapter, from chapter 1. Now, just listen to the people or to the, yeah, the people that he's talking to in chapter 1. Sorry, I don't have the, the, the references here for us. But this is the plan of salvation. He said, he's talking about, and he uses all the words, sorry for laughing here. He uses all the words that a certain group of Christians build a whole world around in the beginning. And I'll tell you those words are election, predestined, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, he's always talking about that. <clears throat> Let me just say this. Paul didn't go to the reformers in order to define those words. So unless you can make that argument from the Old Testament, because that's where he went to get those words, listen to who he's talking to. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that, listen, we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Who's he talking to? No, he's talking to the Jews. We who were the first to hope in Christ. These are not the Gentiles. Because listen to the next verse. In him you also... Now it's the Gentiles. After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Yeah? So he's separating them. He's saying, you also believed. How did you get saved? You believed into this. And you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, again, I'm going to pick up in chapter 1. This is verse 17, I believe. He says that the God of our Father, the uh, uh, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart, these are all uncoverings, spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know the hope of his calling. What calling is that? The same calling he had on Israel to be a light to the Gentiles. This stuff's in the Old Testament. He says that you would know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So all of these things that Jesus accomplished, or God did in Jesus, are, are in accordance with our calling today. The power that works toward us who believe. Yeah? And Paul wrote the, all of, almost all of chapter 1 is like two sentences. He just built these things on and on. So there, there he uncovers for us the plan of salvation. That we had this first as Jews, but now you Gentiles have it as well. This is what he goes back to in, chapter, in the next chapter. So the, the second one is that, that our, our understanding of... I'll tell you, when you have these things going on, I'm going to put this down 
<clears throat> chapter 2 is all about becoming the dwelling of God in the Spirit. And he, goes, he starts off by saying these great things about, the, about what Jesus has done. He turns around and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So he really basically reads the riot act to the Gentiles. You were dead. You had nothing. But then he says this, among them, we too. Who's the we? It's the Jews. You walked like this, but we too formerly walked in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Isn't that crazy? He said, even us Jews were as bad as you Gentiles. We just looked a little different. But we were all dead in this. And then the two most important words, I think, in the epistle, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together. Now, in, in, in English... If you just said, made us alive, the us would infer the together, wouldn't it? Right? If I, if I said, made us alive, that would be us. I wouldn't have to say together, would I? You would, you would understand it. If, but he makes a point of using the word together. It's an emphasis that he's making that Jews and Gentiles were made alive together. He's not saying that the Jews were special and they had an in. They needed the same salvation we need. Made us alive together. See, when you start unpeeling the epistle and you start looking at the language behind it, you start seeing the different parties that Paul is writing to. And he's specifically writing because there was division among them. And he was writing that if you're going to see the church now make known the manifold wisdom of God, you cannot be divided. There must be a oneness in us to show the manifold wisdom of God. I'm getting ahead of myself. He says, in ages to come, he might show the surpassing greatness of his riches and his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus then he reminds them, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. A little snarky there, Paul. You got a little... Which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at one time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's a desolate place to be. You don't get there by nationality. You, you don't get there by political affiliation. There's only one way you get there. And that is the blood of Jesus. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood. For he himself says, well, he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And then I think it's the first time he uses this phrase, so that, that's, let me get a little Greek geeky here. That's so that, it's not every place translated this way, or not every so that is translated from this word. It's what we call in Greek a hinna clause, and it is a purposeful clause. When you see the so that, you should perk up and look and make sure that, is this what he's talking about? This is the most important thing to remember. This is the hinge that tells you something important is really going to come. He says, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, 
and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. There is no justice without God's justice. There is no peace without God's peace. And it's accomplished in Jesus. He himself might make the two into one new man. You could not get two groups of people in in the first century more separate than the Jews and the rest of the world. You couldn't stretch your arms far enough to separate two different people. And there was a dividing wall, and Paul is referencing a dividing wall from Isaiah that God tells Isaiah, I'll build a hedge around you. That's a dividing wall to protect you. That wall was supposed to keep the the immorality of the Gentiles from getting into Israel. But the Jews use it for something else. They use it as a prideful thing to say, we're special, you're not. We have God, you don't. If you want to become like us, you've got to go through these rituals to become like us. Paul says that he broke down the dividing wall. Jesus destroys the dividing wall by taking the enmity between Jew and Gentile to himself and putting it to death and reconciles both groups through the cross to himself because he destroyed it. And it says we both, through him that is, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, the holy ones, and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Yeah, that's New Testament church. Yeah. And what Paul is doing, he's referring to the Old Testament. He's, Jesus already said that the temple the Jews were worshiping in was not the temple. He said his body was the temple. In Corinthians, he tells us that we are the temple. In Ephesians, he says it again. We're the temple. What was a temple? What did you do in a temple? The temple is where heaven and earth meet. It's where the unseen realm shows up in the seen realm. It's where the presence of God shows up on earth. Every religion that has a temple has that concept of why they go into that temple because their view of whatever God is or whoever God is, that's where they meet him in that temple. So what do we do? Nothing. We're the temple. And we're growing into that dwelling of God in the Spirit when we learn to live the way God wants us to live. When we put aside all of the hostilities, all the animosities, all the things that separate us, we, we we're, we're become just a different people. So the first chapter deals with the plan of salvation. The second chapter deals with the dwelling of God in the Spirit. You know, and he's going back, forgive me for this, but he's going back to the Garden of Eden. He's going back to where Adam had relationship with his God. They walked in the cool of the day for fellowship. Where, where God could trust humans with with the the administration of the planet. Made Adam ruler over everything. Yeah? We've got to see that. Paul says this really obscure thing in Corinthians. 
tells the church, don't you know that you will judge angels? Isn't that one of those verses that make you go, huh, do what? Yeah. That we're going to judge angels? He starts to uncover that here in Ephesians. He starts to tell us a little bit about it, a little bit more about it. So the demonstration of God, again, is this idea. I have to get out of one note. That we are to declare, to demonstrate the work of Jesus in our lives. When we get into situations, when we get into all sorts of things, when we go out and we share the gospel, we're to demonstrate the work of God in our lives. What, what does it mean to be someone who is responsible, has the stewardship to share the gospel? Yeah, we can analyze this till it paralyzes us. Or we can start doing it and learn as we go. The three things I've always taught, especially to leaders, but also to the church, to be accountable, that is, walk in the light, to be teachable, to learn continually, to be open to learn new things, and to be vulnerable, to be, to be willing to be corrected. Accountable, teachable, vulnerable. Three-legged stool for growth in the Christian life. You, you employ those three things, and you will grow as a Christian walk in the light and so on, be teachable and be vulnerable. That's the hardest one to be vulnerable. We're kind of born like this. <clears throat> Sorry. Ephesians is an epistle declaring and inviting all humans to comprehend and respond to an apocalypse, an uncovering. And once that apocalypse has been revealed to you, it changes the way you live. Once you see what the church is, it's so easy to mis misinterpret what God is doing in our lives, or whether that is corporately or individually. I believe in the local church. I believe in the universal church. I believe everybody who names the name of Jesus has, has submitted to his lordship and, and believed and been cleansed by his blood is part of that universal church. Um, I, I believe that, but I believe that you have to belong to something locally to work out what's there. Yeah. I travel internationally. I, I've been to more countries than some countries I wish I didn't, hadn't gone to. But I, I've, I've been to places that I never thought I'd go. I am joined to some people who are not of our nationality. They're not Americans. And they're very distant to me culturally. But I, I believe in it. And if I lived in their locality, I would be part of their church. But I'm not there. I'm here. So I believe in the local church. Because that's where we express, that's where we can work out our accountability, our teachability, and our vulnerability. And when we lose that, we lose how to do it. Yeah? You got real quiet. Then. I could hear the hush kind of go down in the room. But that's what makes us the church. Because when we are empty of ourself, he can fill us with himself. And we can express who he is. Yeah? You'll have to come back or watch the next two weeks to see we, where we go with this. This is leaving you, isn't it? Yeah. But in the next two weeks, we'll deal with the last three chapters. I've, I've done my best to kind of unfold the first three chapters. Now, hopefully, it's gotten through. Yeah. And... We'll be able to just take that now and see, because this epistle does divide right at chapter 3 and 4. It does 
up until this place, Paul ends in a prayer. Now, he starts in a prayer and he ends in a prayer. And that's called an inclusio in our hermeneutics. In other words, there's, there's a message between these two prayers. And if you want to dig deeper, you can go and dig deeper. I, I would exhort you to read Ephesians a few times this week. And if you can, read it out loud. It's amazing what you hear when you're reading it yourself. Is it? This, this is free, no charge for this. You know why the Jews read out loud? When you find an Orthodox Jew, see him on a subway, he'll be reading the Torah or be reading one of the prophets, and he's reading, he's mumbling, actually. He sounds like he's mumbling, but he's reading it because that's what the word means, to murmur. Because he gets it here, too. He doesn't just get it here. He gets it here, too. So read it out loud. So you just don't see the words. And if you can... There are Bibles today with no chapter verses, no chapter, yeah, no chapters or verses that you can just get them and read them without either. Because for me, I dissect everything, the numbers, the chapters, just feeds your ADD, you know, like can't concentrate on anything. So I have, I have the, whole, the whole Bible now, basically. It's called the Reader's Edition. And there's no chapters or verses. Just stories. Maybe there is. No, there's just names of books. Very interesting. Okay, so there it is. Did I get my point across? Yeah. This is an uncovering. And it's an uncovering of a mystery that God created hidden. But at the time of Jesus, now, brings it to light. And that he has, through Jesus, let the Gentiles become part of the people of God. Because this is what the church is. The church is not an afterthought. The church was made according to the eternal purposes of God, which he brought about in Christ. I didn't specifically address people that are watching this online, but th this is for you too. This is also for those of you who are watching this online or, or maybe the day after it was originally, was originally broadcast. But th I think that Ephesians is that epistle. It's, it's that declaration of an invitation for all people to come to Jesus. And we, as the church need to take that responsibility, that stewardship. If the gospel has affected you, tag, you're it. There, there's no exceptions. Yeah. And we, we have, we're the ones that are to share this word with the world. And you don't have to look far to see how screwed up it is. And they're all clamoring for hope. Yes. They're clamoring for it. Amen? Father, help us. Lord, if we haven't already been, pierce us with your word. Help us to be vulnerable that your word would pierce us to where we cry out, what must we do? In this case, Lord, not to be saved, but to be stewards of your word. What must we do? How must we act to fulfill and be pleasing to you? We thank you for that, God. Help us. Help us to be your people, God. Help us to love your word just simply because you spoke it. You inspired it. You caused it to be the way we would love a letter from a loved one. Help us to love your word, God, and to seek it and to dig into it. We thank you for that. Help me, Lord, as I continue to prepare and study and uncover the things that are there. Help the people to prepare their hearts to hear it, 
that we realize that church is more about gathering together to edify one another, but it's to build one another in that context, that we are to strengthen one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, that we might be a better place for you to dwell, Lord. And for those things, Lord, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.